Good evening. <coughs> Welcome to uh, this plenary session of uh, the World Economic Forum. The subject is the US economic outlook, particularly in the background of uh, recent fiscal developments. I'm Jerry Baker. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Wall Street Journal. Very delighted to be joined by uh, Jack Liu, Secretary of the US Treasury. Um, Mr. Secretary, let me start by asking you, since we are talking about the fiscal background, uh, yesterday you sent a pretty, or in the last, yesterday you sent a pretty, pretty, uh, pretty aggressive warning letter again to Congress about uh, the need to act on the debt ceiling. Can you just fill us in on what's going on? Because you know we sort of thought this this kind of Icelandic saga was over. We, you know, the last few years we had the, um, you know, we had the the, the 2011 uh, debt ceiling crisis. We had the fiscal cliff. We had the government shutdown last year. We kind of thought the last couple of months that we were past that. Congress has just passed a, a two-year budget finally. What's we're not going back into another round of you know of, of brinkmanship over over the debt ceiling, are we? Well, it's good to be here with you, Jerry, and uh, I certainly hope that uh, we are not uh, about to enter another round of brinkmanship. There's no reason for it. Um, let me go back and uh, kind of say where we are. What I said in the letter yesterday. Uh, Congress last year uh, passed uh, legislation extending the debt limit, our borrowing authority, till February 7th. At, after February 7th, we have some measures we can take. They've been called extraordinary measures, but because they now happen almost every time the debt limit runs out, they don't feel quite ex extraordinary as they once did. Uh, and at different times of the year, those measures have a different length of impact. Because we're now at a time of year uh, when People file for their tax refunds, and we have a lot of checks going out. Uh, and it's a good ways down the road that people file and send in their taxes in April. Um, the extraordinary measures don't last as long as they would in the fall or in other times of the year. Um, it's also uh, some of the measures themselves have different value at different time of the year. Uh, we don't have a lot of uh, some transactions between trust funds that take place in June. You can't move them. Uh, in uh, January or February. So the reality is uh, we track these numbers closely. Um, it looks more likely to us that uh, the, the extraordinary measures will run out uh, at the end of February. Uh, I had indicated to Congress a few weeks ago at the end of the year that it was the end of February or early March. All I did in the letter yesterday was clarify that based on what we now know, it's more likely the end of February. My policy is to keep Congress fully informed. It's Congress's responsibility to raise the debt limit. Um, you know, the budget agreement you described, uh, it actually made the policy, it put in place the spending policy that we now have to finance. Um, there's really no choice but to raise the borrowing authority to accommodate the policies that have been enacted. Uh, otherwise, um, it would be going back to revisit what Congress just agreed to. So I think that as a practical matter, there, there, there's, it's a necessity for Congress to act. It is Congress's responsibility, and we owe them to keep them fully informed, which is what my letter does. And I hope that it, they can do it quickly and without the kind of drama that we saw in October, because that kind of self-inflicted wound hurts the U.S. and the global economy for no reason. So just to be clear, there's no gamesmanship here, and there's no room for maneuver here. At the end of February, you run out the tre U.S. Treasury runs out essentially of runs into the debt ceiling, runs out of borrowing authority. No extraordinary measures. Then you've got to you've got to decide though that that, that it, decision. It, who do, who do you stop paying? Well, at that point, you end up with whatever amount of cash you have and no more borrowing authority, and uh, that is not an acceptable place to be because uh, uh, it it puts in question the ability of the government to meet its obligations. And you know, since 1789, it's been a rock solid guarantee that the United States government meets its obligations on time. Now, I know you and the president consistently ask for, and indeed previous presidents have are too, ask for a clean debt ceiling increase, as they say. That is a straight increase in the total amount of borrowing authority. Um, increasingly, you realistically, that's very, very hard to come by, right? So you, well, you must be expecting, you're not really expecting Republicans in the House to agree to a clean debt ceiling. Yeah, you know, Jerry, we've been very clear with the Congress. Um, the President will not negotiate uh, with the threat of a default, um, that Congress has a responsibility to raise the debt limit. Uh, I think Congress understands the President's position. Uh, you know, I've had conversations with leaders. I know they understand it. And uh, we now have to wait for the Congress to act. Uh, I would urge them to act sooner rather than later. 
and if uh, if they have to go through some rounds of uh, of, of debate, uh, better get it started than to wait till the end. But what kinds of things might you, might are you expecting? I mean, you know, if they said, if the Republicans, in particular in the House, who are the key issue here, obviously, if they came to you and said, well, you know, we'll give you a another whatever it is you need on the debt ceiling, but we've really got to have some action on you know, on corporate tax reform or on, you know, on unemployment insurance? I mean, what's, you know, what, what's the answer? Uh, not negotiating means not negotiating. So I, I'm not going to do it indirectly if I won't do it directly. I mean, I'm happy to talk about corporate tax reform, business tax reform. We have urged Congress to work on business tax reform. Uh, the president laid down in July a frame where I think there is the possibility of there being a bipartisan approach that could work where we lower our, effect, our, our statutory tax rates, get rid of some of the deductions that, that would flatten the, the, the system, and uh, use some of the one-time revenue to invest in infrastructure and help build our economy for the future. So we very much look forward to a discussion with Congress on that. Uh, but on the debt limit, we've made clear uh, that it is not a lever to, that, that can extract something uh, from, from the White House. And as you say, you can use some extraordinary measures to roll over for a few days, but these other measures that some people have sometimes talked about, dramatic, colorful ones, yeah. you know, the trillion dollar, minting the trillion dollar coin or whatever, yeah. that's off the table. I think it? we've been through this enough times that uh, people have looked at these uh, ideas over and over again. Um, and it, it, what this requires is congressional action. There is no magic. The rest of the world, I think, watches this spectacle of, in Washington, it seems every six months now, and thinks, what on earth is going on? This is the most powerful country in the world, the biggest, the biggest debtor in the world, as it happens too, but you know, obviously the most important economy in the world. Democracy, a thriving and, and long-standing democracy. Why on earth do you go through this? Why, why, not, just, why not just eliminate the debt ceiling? So I think that uh, the time is overdue for a discussion about the debt limit as a mechanism. Um, you, you, if, as I was saying earlier, the policies you make um, set in motion how much you spend and how much you raise in taxes. The difference is what you need to borrow. And to pretend that you can make the decision on policy at the back end doesn't make any sense. So there have been discussions over the years about how to reform the debt limit. I would welcome a discussion on that. Um, you know, at the moment, my concern is actually that Congress do exactly what you said at the outset, which is act in a way that avoids creating a false crisis. There is no economic crisis. This is simply a politically difficult thing to do. You know, I, go, I talk to people around the world and they do scratch their heads a little bit about this institution. Very few countries have a debt limit. In most countries, the act of committing funds and committing to a, 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 a borrowing strategy are connected. There are a few countries that have debt limits. Some are stepping away from it because of the same challenges that we face. I hope we can have a serious discussion, but for right now, that you know, we have an economy that's doing well. We ended the year with a strong economy. We have a good for first quarter, I believe, underway. Uh, there's every reason to believe that um, this is going to be a, economically a good year uh, for the United States. And if you look at the you know, IMF report for the global economy, um, what we don't need is to have a lot of noise around something that should be more of a ministerial act, creating uh, you know, headwinds w that offset the natural tailwinds that are occurring because the economy is doing better. Well, let's talk about those tailwinds and the broader economic outlook. Um, you mentioned you know, there's a growing optimism. Uh, what do you think? You said, and you said you, you're going to get stronger growth this year. You think you're going to get 3% growth in this, in this 2014? You know, I'm always reluctant to use specific numbers in, in, in making predictions, but you look at last year, and um, you know, we were in the twos, uh, but we had about 1.5% of fiscal drag from, uh, from spending cuts, from uh, tax other increases. tax increases, mm -hmm. things that, policies that were kicking in, the payroll tax mm -hmm. you know, was rolling off. And... Um, we don't have those headwinds this year. So we have a core economy continuing to show broad strength. Uh, we have the absence of the resistance that comes from, uh, from you know, fiscal consolidation. Um, confidence, as measured by all of the surveys, is strong. Uh, I, I really uh, think that, that there's every reason to be hopeful that we'll do well this year. And, you know, look, I think it's perfectly reasonable to be looking at breaking through three, but I'm not going to sit here and predict, um, you know, where we'll end up. But we're, we're redefining well, aren't we? We're kind of defining success downwards these days. I mean, it's pretty remarkable 
that the US has not had a single calendar year of growth above 3% since 2006, I mean, since before, since 2005. That is, that's the longest period I think the US has gone without a, that kind of growth. We've seen, obviously, a very deep recession and a very weak recovery where we normally expect to see stronger recoveries. And we're all getting kind of incredibly excited and bullish about the fact that we might get 3% growth this year, that we might have you know, an unemployment rate if you add back in those people who've dropped out of the labor force, which is still really around 10%. What's, what's, what's wrong here? There is clearly, you know, granted things are getting better, but they're really not, it's not, the U.S. economy is not performing how we used to see it yeah. before. Look, I think if you look at, at how, uh, if the U.S. were growing at 3% or more a year for a number of years, you'd start seeing a serious dent uh, in, uh, in, in the kind of built up uh, uh, need for jobs because of the deep recession. Uh, it's very hard at 2% to, to make up for the lost ground. You'd start seeing that at 3% in a more serious way. You know, when I talk to my, my colleagues in Europe and um, I tell them, you know, that we're in the twos and we think it's reasonable to talk about 3%, you know, they look at us as if they can't even dream of breaking through a barrier that's like 1% or... You'd rather have your problems than that. So they, they think we have a high class problem yeah. thinking, how do we get to three? Yeah. We feel like our work is not yet done. I mean, we're, we're not satisfied with an economy until we're creating enough jobs so that everyone who wants to work can get a job and can have a good middle class lifestyle. Uh, and we don't think it's okay to work full time and be below poverty. Uh, you know, there are things going on in the economy that are real structural changes that, in addition to the, the, the recovery from the recession, you know, the, the problems we have in, in, you know, to deal with didn't all pop into existence in 2008, but the recession ex really exaggerated the, the impact and hopefully has focused attention so that as we go through the recovery, we can also focus on building a, a, an economy that for the next 10, 20 years is able to generate more good middle class jobs. You know, it, it, it's uh, it, it, at 3% plus growth, it would feel a lot better than at 2%. But, you know, until every American who wants a job has a job, we'll have work to do. So what... What, what, are, what is the structure? Do you, do you buy this, you know, you hear this secular stagnation debate, that there are either structural problems or fundamental long-standing kind of demand deficiency problems in the economy? I mean, it is very striking. You have, you know, the, the, the proportion of Americans who are working is the lowest it's been, I think, in 40 years. You have this weak, weakness in growth. You haven't really had strong growth without artificial monetary or fiscal stimulus for, for, for a decade or more. What, I mean, what, what, what is wrong? What's, 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 fund, what's, how, what's your diagnosis well, of the U.S. Well, look, I think it's complicated. There's not a simple answer. Um, you know, I think we, we, um, we've gone through a period of great change in terms of, uh, of the kinds of jobs people have. You go to any manufacturing facility and you can see it. Uh, the kinds of work people are doing is different. But there are still good jobs to be had. You know, every uh, computer app has a programmer. Every, uh, every production line that's automated has technology and equipment behind it that high-skilled jobs are required to produce. You know, every fancy uh, uh, system requires welders and, and people who make good middle-class livings. We need more economic activity. We also need to train people to have the skills to do it. I often talk to CEOs in the United States, and they are always asking the question, can we be sure we'll have the skilled workers we need? That's our job. One of the jobs of government is to make sure we provide education and training so that people have the skills that have jobs in the marketplace. You know, we have millions of unfilled jobs in the United States. While we have high unemployment, part of it is a skills gap. So we have more work to do to close that. I also think if you look, I, I don't agree with the arithmetic you did in terms of kind of adding the unemployment rate and people who've fallen out of the workforce, because it's more complicated than that. There are some people who retire. There's some demographics. There are certainly some discouraged workers. Sure. Um, one of the things that we have focused on is we've got to really undo the stigma that's attached to being out of the workforce for uh, you know, a long period of time. We've had a deep recession. There are young people whose entry into the workforce was delayed. We've got experienced workers who were separated from their job and have to re-enter in a different job. It can't be that if you're out of work for 18 months, you become damaged goods and you have nowhere to go. And the president will be convening CEOs to have this conversation with business people as well as within government because it's not just a governmental solution. There has to be, across the economy, the notion that we have 
open jobs, we have people looking for work, and we need to match them together. And if there are skill gaps, we know how to close those skill gaps. So I, I'm actually optimistic that we can deal with these issues, but we have to talk about them. In the short run, you know, there, there are also uh, questions, you know, we've had a debate in Washington about whether or not to extend long-term unemployment benefits. Uh, at a time when um, we still have lingering high long-term unemployment rates, uh, at a time when the economy is doing much better, it's still the right thing to do to make sure that people who are looking for work can also get the support of being able to put food on the table while they're looking for work. Anyone who wants to work you know, and is looking for work who's been affected by the recession the way people have should get a little bit more uh, time before, uh, before they're cut off benefits. And you know, we're going to work hard to restore them. Let's talk uh, briefly in the time we have uh, about the financial system, first of all, in the US. Uh, your administration has been pretty active in uh, uh, pursuing financial, financial sector reform. We've had, obviously, uh, Dodd-Frank Act. We've had a pretty aggressive um, enforcement approach from the, uh, from the government agencies, whether it be over uh, the mis-selling um, of uh, mortgage securities and others. Are you now satisfied with, with where, the, where the US financial system is after, you know, five years on from the crisis with this new regulatory regime in place? Well, I think there is no question but that the U.S. financial system is in a much better place now than it was in 2008. Uh, we have much deeper capital. Uh, we have uh, resolution processes in place where if a bank or financial institution fails, um, it is going to be able to work out its own problems and not come to taxpayers for relief. For the largest firms, we have stress tests. We have a single point of entry. Uh, we have now put the Volcker rule in place to limit the amount of risk that firms take in an area that was you know, a problem. And yet, if I may, the so, system is now dominated even more than it was before by, by, yeah. by, by huge banks, by, well, by, by, these, I, by these Leviathans. I think, I think the reality is that when financial institutions failed uh, in 2008, the end result was the pieces had to be picked up and institutions got larger. But I think that the... the, the, the the cost of being a large institution is much higher because of the capital requirements and other uh, new provisions that have been put in place. But I, uh, I've tried to make very clear as I've looked at this that we still have challenges ahead. Uh, we're not completely done in the United States implementing, but we've made great progress. It's been a real priority of mine in my year at the Treasury Department to get, it's not acceptable for hard things to just lay unfinished. You have to tackle them and, if, and work through, whether it's the Volcker rule or capital requirements, and you have to be clear, and, and, and institutions have to know what requirements they're dealing with. Um, I, I think if you look at the kind of global uh, financial regulatory situation, uh, we still have work to do, because uh, cross-border resolution is a big, big issue. You know, when Lehman uh, collapsed, um, the thing that made it become an international financial crisis was the inability to see all of the positions that were affected by it and the cascading dominoes that started to fall and whether they'd be covered or they wouldn't be covered. And we're still a long way off from having clarity of cross-border resolution in the case of a failed financial institution. Real progress has been made. I think just in these last few months, Europe has made progress, but it still has more work to do. Um, and we've got other uh, issues like that that I think this year we'll use the G20 as a forum to really draw attention to. Um, in the area of uh, non-traditional banking, sometimes called shadow banking, it's been an issue that we've focused a lot on, and I know uh, regulators and policymakers around the world have been looking at it from different perspectives because there are different ways that, uh, that non-regulated banking has evolved in different places. But in the United States, we're t look, taking a hard look at money market funds, and the SEC has a rulemaking underway to look at what can be done there. In, in, um, in the kind of overnight market called tri-party repo, the Fed has been looking at it and taking action. We still have more work to do, uh, but I think it's important for us to have an international conversation about this as well, because there are global connections here that are very real. And if you had a collapse of uh, one of these kind of non-bank financial institutions, it could just as easily cause a, a, a global uh, 
you know, problem. And that's why we've taken action in the United States and there are much lower balances in these kinds of accounts than there were at the time of the financial crisis. So again, I think great progress since 2008, but I can't say the job is completed. I can say that great progress will continue to be made um, and, it, and we're going to focus on the international piece going forward. Let me very quickly uh, ask you about another international aspect. You are the Treasury responsible for the enforcement of uh, sanctions, the sanctions regime uh, on Iran. President of Iran, President Rouhani, has been here today. Um, we've, got a, we've got a deal in place. We've got a, a, a nuclear deal in place. Um, it, the clock has started ticking on the six-month time period. There's a lot of concern among some people, critics back home, particularly in the U.S. Congress, that this is, sanctions regime is going to unravel now, that you are, you know, you've, you've, you've granted these sanctions concessions. It's very, very hard to put that genie back in the bottle. Are you confident that whatever happens over the course of the, in six months' time, the, the, the measures that were taken to ensure that Iran does not pursue uh, a nuclear security strategy are going to hold? Well, Jerry, I think it's very important to take a step back and look at what's in this joint plan, uh, which is the, the, the interim agreement. Um, it is very, very specific sanctions relief and very incremental measured sanctions relief against very real changes in Iran's policy in terms of how it's proceeding with its nuclear program and actually rolling back parts of its nuclear program. Um, you know, on the scale of um, the sanctions impact on Iran, it's a very small fraction of the impact that this, this measured relief will grant. At the same time, the core architecture remains in place of the sanctions. The financial sanctions and the oil sanctions remain in effect. Each year, the impact of the sanctions that go into effect is far greater than the one-time relief that was in the joint plan. And you know, I've been very clear with uh, businesses, both in the United States and internationally, that they should be very uh, clear-headed as they think about going and doing business in Iran now because that sanctions regime has not been removed. The oil sanctions, the financial sanctions are in place, and we will continue to enforce it, and we will monitor it to see if there are violations. Uh, so now the reason for the sanctions is to bring Iran to the table, and I think the sanctions work to bring Iran to the table. The modest relief in exchange for the interim steps, it was appropriate. And now the question is, get on with the serious hard business of the, of the final negotiation. Uh, it is uh, way too early to predict the outcome of that, but uh, the only real significant relief from sanctions would have to be connected to a real change in policy that makes it no longer the case that there's the you know, possibility of Iran developing a nuclear weapon. We've one minute, just time for one last question. I'm going to ask you, you've been at the Treasury for a year, uh, in the, in the Secretary of the Treasury for a year. What's the most important thing you've learned in the course of the year as, as Secretary of Treasury? Well, I've, I've, I think anyone who sits uh, where I sit learns a lot every day, um, and uh, you know the, the 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 kind of global nature of what we do. Um, I understood it from a distance, um, but when you're in the role, you experience it differently, and uh, it, and that has a very positive uh, as aspect, which is. Much, if not most, of the world wants the United States out there as a strong player on the field with clarity. So things like the noise in Washington, it's more than a domestic issue. It is really a question of international uh, confidence and international stability. And um, you know, in areas where we take leadership, you know, the, the world looks to us uh, to, to set a standard. Um, and while I knew that before, um, it, it, is a, it is a different thing to experience it and uh, to play that role, and it's a great honor. Mr. Secretary, uh, thank you very much. Please join me in uh, thanking very much uh, Secretary Treasury Jack Lee. Thank you. So thank you very much. Um, I still have, yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary. Thank you all for, uh, for being here. Um, you heard from the Secretary uh, an overview, particularly of the fiscal situation in Washington. As I said, we have seemed to have gone through this movie many times uh, over the last few years in Washington. I think the 
level of optimism that actually we will avoid either the crisis of 2000, summer of 2011, when for a moment it looked like the US was going to, was in danger of defaulting briefly, uh, or indeed the problems we got into uh, last year when the US government was actually shut down for, uh, for a few months. It looks like people are pretty optimistic that we're going to lose that. But let's, let's move on to a, we're going to discuss the broader, uh, some broader aspects of US policy, particularly the international aspects of US economic policy. I'm going to be joined now by uh, Penny Pritzker, the Secretary of Commerce. Uh, and by Mike Froman, the US Trade Representative. So please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you for joining us. Um, let me start with you, if I may, um, uh, Madam Secretary. Um, we, this, we, we probably heard uh, Jack Lou and I talking about the outlook for the economy. One of the things that people are very concerned about is employment mm -hmm. and the fact that for whatever reason, whether it's a result of the continuing effects of the financial crisis, whether there's some structural change going on in the, in the US economy and other economies actually too, the US is just not, the economies are not generating enough jobs. Um, you know, we had even, even with, you know, a, a reasonably strong performance in 20, 2013, you know, job growth, uh, payroll growth, non-farm payrolls averaging 180,000 80, a month increase. That's not, that's not by historic standards particularly strong. Mm -hmm. As I said, we have a lower proportion of the workforce in, a lower proportion of the population in work than the US has had in 40 years. What, what in your view can we do? First of all, does it matter? And does, as, as the Secretary said, maybe we get, need to get used to the idea that not everybody is going to be in work. But what can we do, what, what, what can you do, especially in your, your role working with businesses, to create an environment in which we can get more jobs? Well, first of all, of course it matters. We have too many people in America who want jobs, who can't find jobs. But we also have a lot of, we have four million jobs that are open, that are unfilled. So there's a lot of things that we can do. First thing that we're doing is we're really working with our companies about exports. Uh, you know, for every billion dollars of additional export, there's 5,000 new jobs created. And so at the Department of Commerce, we have our export assistance centers that help companies export, foreign commercial service in country that helps com companies get their products into the markets that we deem together make sense. There's also a big effort, a new effort that the president has started called Select USA, which is around foreign direct investment, where we're really welcoming companies and helping them at the federal level to figure out where they want to be in the United States. We just had a summit at the end of October. 500 companies came from 60 countries. We had 1,300 participants, and we also had 200 economic development officers. So get the right people in the room and deals get done. We had 1,000 people who wanted to come that we were oversold. So very huge demand to figure out how to invest in the United States by foreign companies. The third thing we can do for the first time, we've made skills and uh, workforce development a, a priority for the Department of Commerce. And one of the things we know is that training, we can no longer afford, as my friend the Secretary of Labor would say, we can no longer afford to train and pray. We've got to get the business community involved in making sure that the the curricula and the content of training is aimed at the jobs that exist and the jobs that will exist. And that's a big uh, cultural change that needs to go on where really workforce training is industry-led as opposed to just uh, training-led, if you will. So there's a lot of things that we can be doing. One of the things you hear all the time from corporate executives, your uh, corporate executive, former corporate executives yourself, mm -hmm. is um, you, one thing you could do that would help is tax reform. Uh, particularly reform of the um, very American, let's say, very singular tax structure and the treatment particularly of the taxation of profits earned overseas, which does seem to penalize companies, in fact, does penalize companies, if they bring mm -hmm. uh, money back to the United States to invest in businesses in the United States. You know this is a long-standing uh, debate that's gone on. Everybody seems to be in favor of it. The president has talked in favor of it. Republicans yes. in Congress are in favor. Democrats in Congress are in favor. We're not, we don't seem to be achieving it. What, 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 why can't we break through this logjam? 
Well, I think that uh, corporate tax reform continues to be a, a high priority, but I think there's a few things we have to get done first, immigration reform being one, which also would have a huge economic benefit and frankly would also create jobs in America. So I think it's a question of we have to move through the agenda first. Uh, but corporate America has made a big case that by lowering the tax rate that it will increase their investment in the United States and increase job creation, and the president endorses that that. So I think that it's a question of how much are we going to get through Congress this year and what are the priorities. Not the least of which is, let me say, trade promotion authority, which is a big priority right. that Mike and I are working which on together. Which brings us very nicely to Ambassador Froman. Um, trade, let's talk about trade. Let's talk about trade generally. Let's start off with trade promotion authority. The Congress is still just, just, just right now de debating this. C can, you, can you explain to us what, what, what the administration's position, what your position is as to what the, what, what the Congress needs to do and how that would affect the president's ability to actually to go and negotiate some of these very important trade deals you're trying sure. to get. So trade promotion authority is the mechanism by which Congress gives us our marching orders, tells us what our negotiating objectives are, how to work with Congress during the negotiation, and then what the process is by which they'll approve or disapprove an agreement once we're done negotiating with it. The last of trade promotion authority bill expired in 2007, and so we think it's time for Congress to update their role in trade by telling us again what our negotiated objectives should be and what the process should be. Uh, the last couple of weeks, a bill has been introduced, there's been a hearing, and the administration, the president's made clear we'd like to get trade promotion authority and want to have as broad bipartisan support for it as possible. In the absence of trade promotion authority, we've been working with Congress under the procedures that had already expired. So we consult constantly with Congress about our trade negotiations. We've had over 1,100 briefings on TPP alone with Congress and going through every proposal and every chapter with our, with our committees of jurisdiction. So we work hand in glove with Congress, but we think this TPA bill gives people an opportunity, gives Congress an opportunity to redefine how it wants to see trade done and what role it wants to play in that process. But this is an issue that cuts across party lines, right? I mean, you said you talked about bipartisan pros, but there's also bipartisan opposition to, 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 to doing the kind of things, uh, some of the things that, that you want to do. There's, you know, powerful labor interests uh, on the Democratic side, and there's kind of increasing among you know, some Republicans, very strong opposition to, uh, to, to, to what they regard as unequal, unfair trade, trade packs. Uh, what, what's, how do you persuade, how, how you, what, what's, what, what's the likely outlines of the kind of promotion authority that you're, you're expecting to get? Well, I think there's been a lot of progress over the last year in defining what the negotiating objectives should be. And it's not just the old objectives of, of old trade agreements, but very importantly, it talks about labor standards, environmental standards, striking, uh, the, uh, making sure we're both promoting innovation and assuring access to affordable medicines by poor people in developing countries. And I think this process that's now underway in Congress, where people will look at those negotiating objectives, decide what further steps need to be taken to define them. And then very importantly, a lot of the debate that we hear is about the consultation process and what role uh, Congress should play in that process. And I think that's a very legitimate discussion to, to be had and where Congress should help us define and should help define for us what the process is they want to go through. Jerry, just jumping in here a little bit, you know, when I first was sworn in, I went around the country and talked to hundreds of business leaders. The number one thing that they wanted was trade agreements, whether they were a bicycle manufacturer or a Fortune 50 company. They understood that so much of the supply chain now is global that it's necessary for them to be able to produce their goods. And even if it's selling just to the domestic market, sometimes the inputs come from other places in the world. And so this is a high priority. And I think part of our job is to help explain to those on the Hill their own constituents, what their own constituents need. And what they've said is, give us trade agreements, and we will you know, sell more of our goods and create more jobs. How about what the rest, what, looking at the rest of the world and how it views U.S. trade policy? I mean, are, they, are you coming across, either of you, concerns, particularly you, Ambassador, concerns about the advantage that the United States is clearly gaining now from the en changing energy picture in the United States? A lot of manufacturing, we've heard, read this story a lot, is coming back to the U.S., cheap natural gas, cheap oil, astonishing turnaround in the U.S., the way in, in the U.S. energy balance. Um, and, you know, and, and I can see your point about whether they be bicycle manufacturers or whatever else, that, that, that U.S. Company, companies based in the U.S. want to export, they want trade deals, 
and they are benefiting from this from from significantly lowered energy prices. Are you starting to to, to, to uh, uh, well, the countries that you deal with are they starting to be concerned that actually the U.S. may become actually a source of relatively low cost manufactured goods now? Well, not not concern. I think interest. I mean, every virtually every week, we're visited by companies, American certainly European, but also from the rest of the world, who say precisely for the reasons you've noted. The, one, we're a, a large economy in a good market, we've got a good rule of law, strong innovation environment, strong intellectual property protection, uh, affordable and abundant energy. And now with these trade agreements between a Trans-Pacific Partnership and the Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership, we'll have free trade with about two thirds of the world. That makes the US the production platform of choice for manufacturing. And we see a lot of companies scouring the US and saying they want to put their next factory in the United States in manufacturing to make it in the US and then ship it all over the world. And that has led countries to say they very much want to be part of that story. They want to be integrated with us. They want to be part of our supply chain. And it's not just American companies. We're seeing, com as I was saying, we're seeing companies from all over the world saying, I want to be here. In fact, I think uh, you know VW just announced they're going to expand and invest another $7 billion over the next five years here in the United States. So you're seeing it from very large multinational companies all the way to LaRue Electronics, which is a 25-person electronics uh, firm that um, uh, has expanded their business tenfold by virtue of being able to trade with Mexico. I know this is, a, this is a tangential point, but it's interesting nonetheless. I mean, one of these issues about energy is whether or not the U.S. should be exporting some of this energy mm. to equalize costs around the world. Do you have views on that? I mean, I know you know the president has authorized some changes there, but it's very, very small, small, small scale. Do you think the U.S. should be exporting its uh, this this energy abundance? I think there are studies. I've talked to the Secretary of Energy a little bit about this. There have been studies done about what's a reasonable amount of export that won't implicate or, or hurt uh, American business. I think it merits further study now that we're, but what we need to do is see that um, the current uh, licenses that are being given, they need to come to fruition and better understand uh, what are the implications, what's the reality of all of that. Uh, so I think it's, it's going to take time for this to play out. Ambassador, can you negotiate trade deals without agreeing to export cheap U.S. energy to help up to, so that other countries can benefit from it? Well, we don't tend to talk about energy uh, in, our, in, our, in our trade deals, and Congress has set out in the Natural Gas Act what the criteria are for that, and the Department of Energy is the, the, the institution responsible for, for implementing, uh, implementing that. Uh, but, uh, but I think certainly people are very interested around the world in what's going on in the U.S. in energy, and that's leading to a lot of inward investment, a lot of insourcing back from U.S. companies, a lot of American companies deciding to expand in the U.S., and that's all good for creating jobs. And again, when you put the overlay of the trade agreements there, it creates a powerful incentive to be based in the United States and to ship to the rest of the world. And so we believe that our trade policy is very much part of our inward and our, our investment policy and part very much part of our job creation policy. Let's move on to talk about those specific trade uh, uh, deals that you're in the process of negotiating. TPP first. Walk us through, you know, you, you had been hopeful that uh, we may have seen more progress by now. What, what's going on? You've got, what, 12, 12 countries? In, is it 12 countries? That are 12 countries right representing about 40% of global GDP. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we've had tremendous progress over the last six months, a real sense of, of momentum. Uh, and we're continuing those discussions now. We have teams uh, in, in Southeast Asia meeting with our counterparties. We'll gather the negotiators and the ministers together in the near future. But our goal is to have a high standard comprehensive, ambitious agreement, and we want to make sure we take the time necessary to, to get that right. And that means raising labor standards, environmental standards, uh, striking the right uh, protection of innovation as well as access to medicines, uh, but also taking on new issues. I mean, this will be a, a trade agreement that takes on the issue of state-owned enterprises and what kind of disciplines should be put around state-owned enterprises when they compete with private firms, and a number of other new issues in, in conservation and, and the environment, for example. So there we're breaking a lot of new ground. All the countries are working very well together. All the, uh, the governments are really being creative and innovative in how they approach this negotiation, and I'm confident we're going to come out with an agreement that sets a new high standard around the world and, very importantly, supports job creation and growth in the U.S.
What, what's, what's, what or who are the most difficult issues at the moment? Because we, initially the Japanese were kind of somewhat skeptical, but they now seem to be very enthusiastic. I mean, what, what's, you know, what, 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 I know these things take time, especially with 12 countries, a multilateral process, but what's, what's, what, what, what are the sticking points? Yeah, it's a, very, it's a very complicated negotiation because it's not just a bilateral trade talk, and it's not a multilateral trade talk where you have some independent body like the WTO putting out compromise text. So it's a very complicated negotiation. Uh, there are lots of different issues. I mean, certainly on the market access side, um, I'll, I'll just use agriculture and uh, access to Japan. It's been, we've been clear that uh, we need to get further than where we are uh, right now. Um, uh, uh, but also on the rules side, everything from intellectual property to labor to environment, uh, to SOE reform. These are all you know, key issues, difficult issues, and issues where we want to make sure we get it right, and so we're still working them. Right now, of course, China's not included in this. Do you envisage, if, assuming this goes through, expanding, uh, have an expanded area that would include China? Well, we've always said TPP should be an open platform to which other countries who can meet the high standards should be able to um, uh, accede in the future. And there are a number of countries in the Asia Pacific region that have already indicated that once we're done, once the 12 of us are done with this agreement, that they'd like to be considered for the next round. But the key for, for any country wanting to join is that they be able to meet the high standard and the comprehensive agreement. And, and with, with regard to China, I'd simply say uh, 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 recently China indicated it wanted to negotiate a bilateral investment treaty with us on the basis of a so-called negative list and, and pre-establishment. And that's where I think our focus should be because those are key elements of, of any investment chapter and we'll want to see whether we can make progress there first. Before moving on to, to, to Europe, so just, just quickly, if I can, so what, what do you expect, when, when can we expect at least the out, I mean, I know you've, there have been soft deadlines and they've passed and other things. What, what, what's your, I mean, again, I know I'm not going to pin you here. I'm not going to get news out of you to tell okay. me what the, what the deadline is. But give us a sense of, you know, where, is this, is this going to go on all the way through this year? I mean, what's, you know, you're coming up to an election. But, but you know, once you get to the summer, you're into a pretty full, full, full on U.S. election campaigns. You know, our, our view is that we should let the substance drive the, the timetable. And uh, the key thing is to make sure we achieve that high standard, high level of ambition. And we'll take the time necessary to do it. I'd say that all the countries are actively involved. They're very much focused on this. They're highly motivated. There's a lot of momentum. And we're going to build on that momentum to try and get it done as soon as possible. Madam Secretary, how do you see the domestic politics in the U.S. affecting affecting the whole debate about trade? I mean, it has been it's been a difficult process, as the ambassador says, you know, over over, over a long period of time. Although, you know, some bilateral, some significant bilateral deals have been signed, but there is, you know, without TPA uh, in place now for some time. Do you think do you think the political climate is sh is shifting at all in favor of in favor of being more open towards some of these possible deals? Well, I'm an optimist, and I believe that we're going to get trade promotion authority and ultimately uh, approval of uh, TPP and TTIP. I think that you know uh, Mike is absolutely right. First, uh, we need to uh, TPA is an opportunity for. Uh, the House and the Senate to express themselves about the things that are important to them to make sure they're in those agreements. And obviously the negotiations have are taking that into account, but getting that done is really important as we finalize uh, TPP. But I think these are imminently doable, particularly as we make it you know, information is a very powerful tool. And I think as it becomes clear what's the quality of the agreement, as it relates to some contentious issues, as well as what's the benefit. In other words, we know that if we have more exports, we're going to create more jobs. We also know that if we have more foreign direct investment, we're going to create more jobs. And so, you know, it's a balancing act to make sure that we're touching all of these issues. But I think it can get done. And, I, and so I I'm tend to be optimistic about this. And it's a chicken and egg thing, isn't it? Because stronger growth would surely help, right? You get, you, even, you know, even in advance of trade agreements, if you get stronger growth, you get the unemployment rate down a little bit, people are going to feel a little less. Because obviously one of the things that people feel about negotiating trade deals with other countries is a certain vulnerability. They don't, always, they don't see the upside. They always see the downside. And presumably if you've got some stronger growth, that would... That would but I think it's really... I think it's incumbent upon us, and we're, and, and, uh, we're working very hard on the Hill to, to tell the story and to make sure it's really understood. Obviously, more growth begets, uh, you know, more confidence. But I think, as, as Secretary Liu has talked about, you know, I think the United States is in a pretty terrific position, you know, relatively speaking, in terms of its potential for growth, you know, as you look at 
take, you know, we've talked about energy, but you have to combine that with really our commitment to rule of law, our investment in R&D, uh, and, and uh, uh, our in intellectual property protections, uh, and the ingenuity and flexibility of our people, which is, pro is a tremendous asset. I don't think you would see the kind of recovery that we've come through in a very difficult time if you didn't have people who are flexible and able to react uh, to the situation. So, you know, I was in Detroit last week and at the Consumer Electronics Show the week before. I mean, innovation is abounding in this country. It's exciting what's happening. And so in, I in think... In the United States, you mean, yeah. yeah. In the United States. Maybe in Switzerland too, but certainly. Right, in the United so, so, States, forgive United me, States. in the United States. And so there's, uh, uh, you know, I think that, uh, I think that confidence is building. Jim, yeah. I just add to that, you know, and this goes back to your first point, we've had 46 months of job creation, 8.2 million private sector jobs, 1.3 million of those jobs are due to exports. Exactly. A third of our GDP growth coming out of the, the Great Recession was due to exports and trade. And so I think the more we can tell the story about how exports by us opening markets, leveling the playing field by raising standards around the world, and then very importantly, fully enforcing our trade rights and taking cases to the WTO as, as necessary is a key part of driving job creation here in the US. And yet, the reason I ask the question is, as you well know, one of the, the hottest political topics talked about a lot here, it's talked about in the US all the time and around the world, is this issue of inequality. And, and look, people wrongly maybe sometimes ascribe it to globalization, but what, you, what, what we do seem to have, one of the thing, phenomena that do seem to be at play is that um, globalization is certainly, is certainly aiding those who have capital and access to capital. Um, it is, you're, you know, you're going to make the point, and I'm sure that you know, manufacturing jobs have, tend to have higher wages than, than, than service jobs, and that's true. But there is also, a, there's, there's a profound sense of unease in the country, in, in the United States in particular. You saw it in the election of uh, Bill de Blasio in, in, in New York. You hear it all the time in political rhetoric. And, and, and there is an association with a global, global economic elite that, whether it's in the financial sector or more broadly, that is that is that is making hay while while a lot of while the middle class is really really struggling. And I'm just wondering in that environment whether how you can how you how 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 easy it is really to make the case that we need more globalization. We need to integrate the U.S. more into the global economy. You know the, these concerns are are real and they're legitimate. But we also don't operate in a static world. Mm -hmm. uh, the, it, the world is integrating itself. And there are other countries out there working to negotiate agreements. And you know, we're, we're out there with TPP as an example, insisting that there be high labor standards, high environmental standards, um, the access to medicines, disciplines on state-owned enterprises. But there are a lot of other deals being negotiated that don't have those kinds of disciplines that aren't trying to level the playing field, aren't trying to raise the standards. So from the perspective of the American economy and the American worker, we're part of a global economy. We'd much rather be part of it in a world where we're setting the rules or helping to set the rules and raising the bar. Mm -hmm. If we're involved in a race to the bottom, that's not a race we want to run and that's not a race we can win. But if we can help raise the bar and set a race to the top, then we're in much better shape and it's much more supportive of American workers and American firms. Madam Secretary, as I said, you experience both in business but also in politics. You've, you've, you've been involved in campaigns. Do you, how do you think this issue of inequality, of, of this concern about inequality is going to play out in the United States? And how are politicians going to address, or are both persuasions going to address it? Well, I think it, obviously it's a real issue. The statistics and data have been coming forward uh, uh, over the past few months and something that actually the past few years. Uh, I think that it's very important that we take this seriously. And it's why you see the president calling for, in the United States, raising the minimum wage. And you see companies, even here, I was talking with some American companies who are saying, seriously, they are talking about coming out and endorsing an increase in the minimum wage. We've got to have a, a situation where the middle class continues to grow. It's important uh, for our economy. It's important for the world. And so I think the fact that we're focused on it is very good. And I think that, but I think there are a lot of things that we can be doing. I think one is skills, as we've talked about. I fundamentally believe the case it can be made for exports and, and uh, investment in the United States, that that will also help improve uh, 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 incomes. If you look at 
you know, foreign direct investment, the average earned income from for someone who's working for an American subsidiary of a foreign company is $77,600. These are good jobs. And so we need to make sure that people understand the data and understand the benefit. But there's also, you know, the issue of women. We have to focus on the fact we're paying women 77 cents on the dollar that we pay men for the same job. And women are two, you know, two thirds of families are headed by women. And so I think that there's a real issue that we've got to focus on this or we're going to have, there's potential serious ramifications. But it's striking that you say immediately one of the, the main measures you, you would favor and the president favors is an increase in the minimum wage. Again, something that is, that is an imposition on business, right? I mean, I know you won't don't frame it like that, but there is a view among business, you will know, that there has been a tremendously tough regulatory environment over the last five years, you know, coming out of Washington, whether not just in the financial sector, but more broadly, and the way actually what, what, what business needs is to, is, is to be freed of some of those regulations. That would create more jobs. That would create an economy that was better able to compete uh, in, in the global economy. You know, one of the reasons that I went into the public sector uh, to take on this responsibility is, is that, we, you know, an obligation and a sense of responsibility to all Americans. And for me, I think that, you know, as a business person, and I've been 27 years in the private sector, you know, it can't be that just the leadership is winning. We've got to have our employees who are making a living wage, who can support their families, so that they can go on and educate their families and make sure that, the, that you know, future generations are flourishing. And if, if we don't have economic mobility in our country, that's a very serious problem for the future economic growth of the country. So it's very much intertwined. And I think business leaders understand that. And I'm not hearing so much of the, this is an imposition but rather, what, what are the right opportunities? How do we address this? They're in favor of the minimum wage increase? Well, I think that, you know, I think that there's a view that it depends on what business you're in, right? But I think there is a recognition that you can't have just the top of the food chain being successful. That's not sustainable. And we have to have a sustainable recovery here. We have a moral obligation as leaders to think about that. Let me, we're running out of time, Ambassador. I just want to quickly ask you, we mustn't forget Europe. Um, uh, you have all these acronyms. I think it's TTIP, right? T -tip. It's, you, we have TPP, TTIP. You have more acronyms than the US Army, I think, <laughs> these days. What's the, uh, just give us a sense there. I mean, you, I'm sure you'll be having meetings, uh, both of you having meetings while you're here. What's, what, what, what's, what's, the, what's the promise of progress there on Well, it's, it's well underway. Uh, we've had three rounds of negotiations. We're having continuing discussions over the next... Uh, several months, and I think we're making good progress working through the issues. I mean, the good news is uh, we see many of the issues in the same way, uh, but the ones that are remaining are ones that have always kept us from getting to this point in the negotiation. I mean, the reason we don't have a free trade agreement with Europe isn't because nobody ever thought about it, it's because it's hard and there are obstacles. And uh, the question is whether the political will is there right now and the circumstances are right for us to be able to address those, and we think it is, and we're going to work hard to try and get that done. Particular issue of this, I know there's concerns about financial, about, you know, about, about whether, whether you can do anything in the financial field, given the differing financial regulatory regimes. I mean, is that, is that, is that a, that's a key issue, right? That's, a, that's certainly an issue that the Europeans have put forward. You know, our view is financial services are a key part of the relationship. Uh, uh, there's also a lot of regulatory activity going on post-crisis, bilaterally, through the G20, through the Financial Stability Board, the BIS, IOSCO, all the various organizations. And we think that kind of regulatory cooperation is very important and should continue to proceed alongside and in parallel to TTIP. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Secretary Pritzker and uh, Ambassador Froman have been very generous with their time. Please uh, join me in thanking them very much for being with us and thank you too.